Good evening, all. For those of you who are joining us on video, welcome. My name is Signora Beatrice Domenici Dal Campana, called Beatrice. This is a class on court courtesy and protocol being taught for the Barony of Terra Pomaria and its sergeantry candidates. Uh, the original class was offered on Sunday, the 27th of September. And uh, unfortunately, the recording of that class uh, was juggled slightly. And so the first section of this video that you are now watching is a re-recording. Uh, we are going to attempt to have it include all of the material that was covered in the original class. But if you were at that original class and you are coming back to this recording for something that you remember from that initial class, this first part of the video will not be exactly what you remember from the live class because it was recorded at a later time. If you have questions, please do feel free to contact me. My contact information is later in the video. So, good evening, hello, and welcome. Uh, I am joining you from the cold reaches of North Shield as we move into autumn. And 23, 23 and a half years ago, I started in the society and had just accepted the Herald's Office of the Shire of Cordoval. I was very new and very, very new to office holding and to heraldry in our society. I had attended a local moot. I was attending my very first SCA event listed in the crier. So my first kingdom listed event. And it happened to be Bargamouth, hosted by the Barony of Terra Pomaria. Uh, and as the soon to be Herald of Cordoval, I approached the then Herald of Terra Pomaria, then Lord William, who many of you may know as Sir William, former Baron of Terra Pomaria. Lord William kindly welcomed me and offered to have me assist with baronial court, mind at my first event. There was a piece of court shtick. They were doing the barroom brawl, short weapons, indoor tournament, and the end of court was going to be William rushing off to keep the barroom from being busted apart. And so Baron Cesare and Baroness Astrid's herald was leaving court before court was over. And so at my very first event, I closed the court of Cesare and Astrid, Baron and Baroness of Terra Pomaria. 23 and a half years later, I have this very small chance to pay forward a kindness in coming to teach to the barony that welcomed me so many years ago. So court, court is theater. Court is about pomp and circumstance and making it look good. Court is about making the nobles look good. Court is also very serious. There is business. There are people being given awards who are being called up. And for some of them, this may be the first or even the only time that they are called into an SCA court to be recognized for something that they have done. There may be more solemn business. There may be the reading of laws. There may even be banishments. But ultimately, court is the theater that separates us as a society from so many other social groups. It is the pageantry, it is the pomp and circumstance. It is the, the thing that makes us the SCA in very many ways. There are rules, there are customs to our court and it is hard to go wrong if you follow those rules and customs. It says on the inside of the crowns of the kingdom of Kaid, 
You rule because they believe. And the members of the court, that is to say, not just the nobility, but their herald, their retainers, their guards, all of the people that make up this sort of onion that creates court as theater are supporting that belief in the audience, from the audience, and even of the people who are a part of the onion by reverencing to the thrones, by addressing people by their titles. We are creating that belief that makes our nobility real in a very real way. Yes, it is still a game of make-believe, but there is a reality and a solemnity to it that is there because we treat it so. Good theater, good court, relies on timing, on pageantry, on the customs and the ceremony. Let's talk a little about that ceremony. Court generally begins with the nobles, whether that is a king and queen, a prince and princess, a baron and baroness, a royal peer who is holding court either in a shire to which they are a patron or a court of their own to recognize people who they think are worthy. Whether they start sitting in their seats or they process, generally the populace, the audience, starts court on their feet. It is a gesture of respect and acknowledgement that the court is in the control of the nobility. This is very similar to a modern legal court the judge enters, everybody stands up. If the nobility are processing down an aisle of some sort through the audience, it is generally considered customary for members of the populace, members of the audience to reverence in some way as the nobles pass by them. Now, that reverence can be a bend of the knee, a nod of the head, a bow at the waist, a curtsy, anything that for you is comfortable, that is persona appropriate, that is not going to endanger you or those around you, and that acknowledges the solemnity and the rank and nobility of those who are processing, of those whose court you are within. Now that said, if for any reason you cannot or will not make a reverence to a noble in our society, whether that's for religious reasons, whether that's part of the SCA game that you play, that's absolutely acceptable. This is not a requirement. This is part of the custom. This is part of the shared game that we play. So most people you will see do this but if you feel uncomfortable doing so, please do not feel like you are obligated to do so. As the nobility press processes forward, and there may be more than one set of nobility, depending on how large and grand a court it is, uh, generally it is done that a uh, reverence is made for each set, or if you have particularly well-trained leg muscles, you can go into a bow or a curtsy and simply hold that reverence for the entire procession. I congratulate you on your stamina if you can do so. Once all of the nobility has gotten to the front of court, has made it to their seats, they will generally take their seats and then the populace, the audience will be given leave to sit to take their ease that leave may be given directly by the nobles whose court it is, or it may be relayed by their herald if 
the royals choose to do it that way or do not have the speaking voice to be heard in the back row. <clears throat> in general, if you see everybody else sitting down, it's probably time for you to sit too. If you are called into court, generally there are, you can either be called for a planned reason or you can be called for an unplanned reason. Did you know in advance? If you are called because you know that you are going to be called, sit somewhere where it is easy for you to get to the aisle, where it is easy for you to get into court. Um, if you do not know that you are going to be called and you hear your name called forth, please take your most expeditious route to the center aisle or to a path that will lead you to the nobility. You are not required to go out and all the way back and around. Please do not waste the court's time. The pacing of court is important and the time, not just of the nobility, but of the populace is valuable. And if you have sat through long courts, I am certain that you too are appreciative of those who do not waste your time. So please return that courtesy. Once you have reached the center aisle, you may be offered an escort, a member of the noble's guard who will offer you an arm. Uh, this is especially true for uh, single ladies, but it is not a gender determinate sort of thing. Uh, if you are, if one of the guard approaches you and has an arm out or an elbow, take it graciously. Uh, allow them to escort you forward. When you reach a reasonable distance from the nobility, and my rule of thumb here is generally wherever the first row of audience is seated. In some outdoor venues, that may be 15 or 20 feet away from the nobles. In a more crowded, intimate indoor hall, we may be talking about three or four feet, but wherever that first row of audience is, when you get even with them, you will make the first of your reverences. Again, if you are of a conscience to do so. Your reverence generally should include whoever the highest noble is that is present and whoever has called you forward. You may make a respectful gesture in the direction of any other nobles on the dais, but it is not required and in fact often takes entirely too much time to make individual bows to everyone seated in front. Again, please be respectful of the nobles and of the populace and do not waste their time. If you have a persona appropriate reverence, a Japanese persona who is doing a, uh, a kowtow, for example, where you go to the knees and place your forehead to the floor, uh, please ensure that these two are not taking up an excessive amount of time. Practice them so that you can do them gracefully and expeditiously. If your persona would have done a more involved bowing or respect ritual, general court is not the time for that. If it involves, you know, nine bows to the royals, being called up to announce the winners for a tournament is probably not the time for that. There is a time and a place for something that is that involved and that persona specific. That time and place would be should you be elevated to an order of peerage or should you be elevated to a title of nobility, uh, to a throne or to a baronial seat. That is the time for that sort of pageantry that takes a little bit more time, where the pageantry is the show. When it is the business of the court and it is the business of someone else's court, please be brief. You may be persona appropriate, but please be brief. The question has come up about disarming. Who may and may not bear weapons or arms 
into the presence of the nobility. This is very much a question of interkingdom anthropology, and I can address it in very general terms. Uh, generally, what I would say is don't go armed to court. Yes, that sidearm is lovely and dashing and looks fabulous with your doublet, and it's terribly awkward to sit with for three hours, leave it in camp. A small eating dagger is probably not a danger to your crown. You can leave it on your belt. A large spear is going to be a viewing hazard to those behind you. Please be polite, leave it in camp. Use your common sense, my lords, my ladies, good gentles, all. Now that said, in some kingdoms, it is only the, um, the knights who are permitted to bear arms into the presence of the crown because in a uh, in a way through their fealty those swords belong to the crown in some places that is extended to all of those who are in fealty to the crown that anyone in fealty directly to the crown may bear arms in the crown's presence there are some places where being bestowed an award of arms, being given the right to bear arms, is interpreted not in a heraldic sense as in to bear armory, but in a more literal weaponry sense, you then have the right to bear weapons in court. Check with someone knowledgeable and local to you if you wish to bear arms into court and you are not sure of your local custom. If you are in doubt, if you do not have a chance to check with someone, err on the side of caution, err on the side of going unarmed. The exception to this is if you are in service as part of this onion as a guard to court at which point you would be bearing weapons in service of the court, whether that's a spear or a sword or a halberd or some sort. Uh, so if you are asked to be a guard for court, that is a question that should be answered by the nobles whom you are serving, is if they wish you to bear weapons and if so, how. Once you have made your reverence to the highest person on the dais, to the person who has called you forward, move forward to the presence immediately in front of whoever has called you forward. They called you, go see them. Almost invariably, immediately in front of them, there will be a cushion or a kneeling stool. It is intended for your knees. Please kneel on it. I have seen entirely too many humans who see this lovely, beautiful, embroidered applique pillow and go, oh, I don't want to ruin it and kneel on the floor off of the cushion. No, really, it's there for kneeling. Please kneel on the cushion. These cushions are designed to take that sort of use and abuse. Please do so. In some places, the barony of Tara Pomaria, I understand, has a beautiful new oak kneeling bench with handle to help you get up to make it easier for those who may find it more difficult as we age to get into and out of a kneeling position. Now, that said, if one of these uh, kneeling benches is not available, or if you are physically unable or constitutionally or consciously unable to make a reverence or to kneel in front of the nobles who have summoned you, you are not required to do so. You may make a quiet explanation. I have bad knees, I have a bad back, or you may simply say, I need to stand and no explanation is required. If you are going up unknown business. You have the results of a tournament to announce, or you are the event steward and are going forth to thank your staff. It is probably not necessary for you to kneel, for you would be immediately rising to address the populace. So rather than kneeling, 
you would ask permission of the nobility to address the populace or have a conversation with them about whatever business brings you forth. If you do not have a voice that will carry to the back rows of court, please allow the herald to announce whatever it is you have to announce. You can write it on a three by five card. You can provide wording in advance. You can tell them and they will repeat it for you. There are any number of options, but the heralds are there so that the business of court can be heard. And if you cannot be heard, please allow the heralds to do their job. If you are being called forth for an award or you just don't know why you've been called forth, you've made your reverence to the dais at large, you've moved forward, you've made your reverence to the nobles who called you forth, you have taken your place on the cushion or the kneeling bench, and you eagerly await, or perhaps trepidatiously await, to see what their pleasure may be. They will let you know. Their herald may let you know. Their herald may let the world know. In fact, their herald will almost certainly let the world know. Once whatever business that is is finished, accept whatever deedly bobs you are handed, whether that is an award scroll or a thank you token or a muck and big mall or whatever it may be, say thank you. If a hand is offered to you to help you up, please accept it. It is offered courteously. Please accept it courteously. Uh, struggling with skirts can be awkward. Even gentlemen, tunics are a form of skirt at some length. And so kneeling and unkneeling in skirts can be a challenge. Uh, accept the things that have been handed to you. And when you have been dismissed, take one or two steps backwards if it is safe to do so. Please do not back up off a dais. Please do not back up into humans. Please do not fall off of stairs. And if you are not safe personally to walk backwards, please don't do it at all. Make your reverence to those who called you forth and make your way back to where you made your first bow. You do not need to do this backwards. When you get to the place where you made your first bow, stop, face the dais, and again, acknowledge the nobility of those arrayed before you. Again, if it is not in your conscience to make reverence, you may stare them down defiantly if it pleases you to do so. But good theater calls for a pause there. If you were escorted forward, this is where your escort will pick you back up to escort you back to where you were seated for court. Speaking of escorts, if you have a significant other who is in the society, have a conversation with them about court escorts. Do they want one from you? Do you want one from them? How will you arrange that? Make it known between you in advance. If they are called up, would they like you to walk up with them? If you are called up, would you like them to walk up with you? If you are escorting someone, it doesn't matter much which side of them you are on. There are arguments in both directions. I won't get into it here. There's one side that says, you know, we take it as dance and the lady is always right. There is the other side that says, well, the gentleman is defending her and therefore must have his right arm free so that he may draw his sword and defend her honor. Pick one. Pick whichever side she happens to be on. You don't need to do multiple little do -si dos in the aisle. Do not waste the court's time. If you are offering an arm, and I will attempt to show this, hold your arm up a little lower than shoulder height and at about a 90 degree angle, 
with your hand offered flat. Your, the person who you are escorting should lay their hand atop yours and their forearm along yours as well. If you are significantly taller than the person you are escorting, drop the height of your elbows so they are not doing this. Because this is terribly uncomfortable. Please don't make us do it. Um, you may also, if you are being escorted and you do not feel comfortable or uh, for some reason it is an awkwardness for you or you're just more comfortable the other way, you may do the more modern of hooking your hand inside the offered elbow. That is also an acceptable way to accept an escort that is offered. If you are escorting someone and you are not a member of the court guard, when you reach that first row of the audience, you both make reverence to the nobles on the dais. The escort peels off and kneels or makes some other way of getting out of the sight line of the audience. And the person who was called moves forward to do their business. When the person who was called is finished, their escort rejoins them at the first line of the audience. They both make the final bow together and proceed out of court. So have that conversation with your significant other and know whether being an escort or being escorted is important to them. Make those arrangements because it looks very smooth if you've arranged it in advance and there is no hushed, flustered conversation. It is just hand up and escorted and it looks like it is fabulously practiced because at the very least you have had a conversation about it. That is all there is to being called up in court. Not everyone will be, but most people at some point or another will be called into court. And it isn't all that scary. These are the same nobles who you see sitting around the campfire. These are the same nobles who you're fighting on the practice field and around the Eric or are offering water to. And they are serving in these roles because they want to make the society better because they enjoy doing the things that they get to do in court. I have spoken with many nobles over the years and almost unanimously, they have said that the greatest reward of their jobs has been being able to recognize the excellence, the service, the arts, the combat, the deserving people that they have been able to recognize while in these roles. And if you're being called up in court, you're helping them do that. This is not a scary thing. And I hope that you will enjoy your moment as part of the onion, that you will enjoy being part of the theater of court if you should have any questions or concerns or want to speak further about these topics, please do feel free to get a hold of me. I am not hard to find. And we will move on to the next topic. Um, so, having gotten through court, let's have a conversation about titles and forms of address. Um, these are not the same thing, although they are inextricably linked. Um, and this is, I will tell you, a place where Beatrice has opinions with a capital O. Um, so uh, you will be getting Beatrice's opinions in addition to sort of the society typical practices. Um, the official list of alternative titles and accepted titles at any given rank can be found at the Laurel Qu Sovereign of Arms, currently Queen of Arms website, 
at heraldry.sca.org. That will give you alternate titles in many languages. Um, my own title, Senora, is the alternate title at both the award of arms and grant of arms level in Italian. Um, there are no distinctions in title between the award of arms level and the grant of arms level. None. There are no official title distinctions. That said, there are forms of address at the grant of arms level that are not appropriate at the award of arms level. Those at the, at the grant of arms level may be appropriately addressed, although non-periodly, as the Honorable Lord or Honorable Lady. Those are post-period forms and will make Beatrice cringe. Or as your Lordship or your Ladyship, which are period terms and I can document from the OED, that being the Oxford English Dictionary. Beatrice has opinions. Neither of these is a title. They are forms of address, much like your excellency, your grace, or your majesty. The appropriate title at the grant of arms level is Lord, Lady, Gentle, or excuse me, Noble or Armager, which are the approved titles or their language equivalents. Titles include Baron, Baroness, um, Viscount, Viscountess, Count, Countess, Duke, Duchess, Prince, Princess, King, and Queen, along with all of their language equivalents. Forms of address include Your Excellency, Your Grace, Your Highness, Your Royal Highness, Your Majesty, Sire, uh, Your Honor, which is a period form of address uh, equ for equivalence to knighthood, but has never really taken hold uh, in the society, uh, but it is a period form of address. It is in fact why we call judges uh, modernly your honor uh, is because originally British judges were all knights. And so they were given the honorific your honor because of their title of knighthood, not because of their position as magistrate or judge. Um, Random factoids from the protocol droid. Um, so generally you do not use a form of address when referring to yourself. Ideally, you have someone else introduce you. If it is impossible to have someone else introduce you, which in this day and age it sometimes is, you must introduce yourself to someone, um, you may choose to include your highest or preferred title, or you may introduce yourself only by name. That is up to you. Um, there are some people who consider the inclusion of their titles gauche. Um, there are some people who consider leaving the titles out hiding things. Um, and so there are arguments on either side, um, which is one of the reasons why it is always preferable to have someone else introduce you. Forms of address should only ever be used in the second or third person. I would never, and I, I cringe a little just to say this, um, but I would never say, I am my ladyship, because that just, that's not how it's done. It is similarly grammatically incorrect to refer to myself, and again, I cringe just saying this, I am the honorable lady because that isn't how this works. The honorable is a form of address. It was used for the younger children of peers post-period in England, but holders of grants of arms got a little knocked out of shape that they didn't get a special title is kind of my best guess. Um, but there is no extra title at the grant of arms level, but there is there are two new honorifics. 
the honorific Your Excellency is shared across multiple ranks and titles. It is appropriate to address as Your Excellency those with the title or rank of Baron or Baroness, Viscount or Viscountess, or Count or Countess. Um, in general, if you see somebody with a hat that has points on it, your excellency is an excellent guess at how to address them. If, if you have to take a shot in the dark, it's not a bad shot to take. Um, your grace is the correct form of address for a duke or a duchess. Um, your highness is the correct form of address for a territorial prince or princess. Your Royal Highness is the correct form of address for a crown prince or princess, that is to say the heirs to a kingdom, and your majesty or your royal majesty are correct forms of address for the king and queen or crowns of a kingdom. Here we arrive at yet another place where Beatrice has opinions. Relationships are not ranks and they are not titles. A relationship includes being a squire to a knight, includes being a protege to a pelican, includes being an apprentice to a laurel, includes being a provost to a member of the, the order of defense, and includes being a sergeant or me member of an equivalent group to a baron or baroness. Those, I hate to use the word titles, those words only have meaning as relationships. You are never Sergeant Bob. You are Bar Bob, Sergeant to Her Excellency Tara Pomaria. You are never Squire Bob. You are Bob, Squire to Sir John. Without the relationship, it means nothing. It is not a title and using it as such is prohibited by corpora. I can cite you chapter and verse if you would like, but I will not bore you with trying to find it right now. If you are ever called upon to herald a list or to invite someone into court and they put squire or sergeant in front of their name, you do not announce it in front of their name and if they insist that you must announce it, you find out to whom they are sworn as a squire or a sergeant, and it goes after their name with that relationship. Yes, as someone just posted, so Sergeant Bob is kind of like saying boyfriend Bob, in that it begs the question of whose sergeant or boyfriend Bob is. Yes, very much so. Um, and the other thing is that um, and this is more true with squire than with sergeant, but to become someone's associate, to become the dependent of a peer, has no inherent qualifications. It means that one peer decided to hand, decided to make you an associate of theirs. That isn't a rank, that's a relationship. It is arguable that within a barony, the, the barony could write laws such that the sergeantry had rank within that barony should the crown allow it, um, since there are requirements for it and such. But generally, neither sergeant nor squire nor protege nor apprentice are to be treated as ranks. They are not. They are relationships. Beatrice's opinion in this case, backed up by corpora. <laughs> this one's more like Beatrice's soapbox. The regalia of rank. How do you recognize someone so that you can address them correctly? Um, in on tier, ranks below peerage are really hard to tell because there are not standardized regalias for those ranks. Uh, if someone is a member of one of the grant orders of Ontier, they may have about their person a medallion or other display of the badge of that grant order. In which case, if you do not see regalia of a higher rank, you may address them by the honorific um, 
appropriate to a holder of a grant farms. That is to say, if you must honorable, though it is post period, or lordship or ladyship. Um, the members of the orders of the peerage, uh, the four, um, the four non-royal peerages, pardon me, are generally recognized uh, through a display of the badges of their order. Uh, the chivalry are the most consistent in their display of the badges of their order. Uh, I have seen knights getting out of their car in the parking lot still in shorts and a t-shirt with their belt and chain on. Um, members of the orders of the Laurel and the Pelican and the Order of Defense generally wait until they are in garb before they put on the regalia of their respective orders. Um, the members of the Order of the Laurel may be recognized by their wearing of a laurel wreath, which may be a pin, a medallion worked into their clothing along the edge of a hood as a circlet. Um, there's all kinds of ways that they can be worn and they can be big, bold, and butch or itty bitty and hard to find. Um, similarly, the members of the Order of the Pelican uh, may wear their, the badge of their order, a pelican in its piety, um, or a pelican voling itself, the difference being whether or not it has an attendant nest and chicks. And they are, uh, again, the, that badge may be worked upon their person as a medallion, as a uh, circlet, embroidered onto their clothing. I have seen rings worn. Um, it can be very large and very obvious or very, very hard to see. Um, and there are some peers who choose not to wear any regalia of their order. Uh, there's some debate about whether that is appropriate or not, and this is not the forum for that debate. Uh, members of the Order of the Defense um, are entitled to a white livery collar and it must be white, not silver, um, which is uh, across the shoulders, pendant from which is the badge of their order. Um, they're generally a little more consistent about both how they wear the, the badge of their order and in doing so in general. Titles for the peerage, the members of the order of the chivalry uh, who have chosen the path of knighthood are almost universally addressed as sir. Um, sir and their given name. This is true regardless of gender. Uh, a number of years, very many years ago, uh, the few at the time female knights in our society were asked whether dame should be continued to be reserved for them. And universally they said, no, we, we use sir. And so the use of the title dame was opened up to the rest of the peerage. Any member of the orders of peerage um, the Masters at Arms and Masters and Mistresses of the Orders of Defense, Laurel and Pelican. Uh, their title is Master or Mistress or a language equivalent. Uh, and again, usually combined with a given name. Uh, none of the titles granted in the society are used with a by name. So I am Lady Beatrice, if you are addressing me in English, not Lady Della Campana, because I am not it is not a family title, it is not a landed title, it is a personal title. And so it is associated with my given name, not with any of my by names or surnames. So uh, there are a few other pieces of regalia uh, by which you can recognize some of the members of the Order of the Peerage. Uh, they are less common, but you will see them sometimes. Uh, members of the Order of the Chivalry may be wearing roweled spurs unless someone is an equestrian and needs them to control their horse, someone's just sort of walking around. If they have on spurs, chances are good they will also have on a white belt and a chain. Um, as a matter of interkingdom anthropology, there are some kingdoms in which, um, such as on tier, any unadorned chain is reserved to the knighthood, whether that chain is gold or silver or of another metal. Um, however, the children of the mid-realm 
and I believe this has crept over into the East and children of the East, uh, only gold chains are reserved to the knights and silver chains are worn by squires. Um, and so at a glance in firelight, it can be very difficult to tell the two apart. As for personas of another culture, um, generally if someone has a preferred title in an alternate language, they will make it politely known to you. But it is never incorrect to address someone politely. You can always, and this is one of my next one of my next points, it is always courteous and correct to address anyone of any rank, any persona, as my lord, my lady, or good gentle. And that counts from the newest new person all the way up to their majesties themselves. Anyone may address any other person in that way, period. Should someone decide that that is a horrible breach of courtesy and how dare you not use my title, their rudeness is much greater than yours. Come talk to me. Find your closest peer. Find your baron and baroness. That is absolutely not an acceptable response. It is always appropriate to address anyone as my lord, my lady, or good gentle always. So the spurs for the chivalry, there are also um, some members of the order of the pelican who wear a cap of maintenance. Um, this is defined as a red uh, hat with an upturned brim of either ermine or of white fur gooty de song that is with red drops of blood on it. Um, I have seen these in lots of different styles. The most common is the sort of Robin Hood hat, sort of the point at the back and, and broader at the, or point at the front and sort of broader. Um, but I have also seen these as Norse skull caps. I have seen these um, very similar to the inner cap that is under the, the crown of state of Great Britain. I have seen these I know someone who has a giant pointy gnome hat that is a cap of maintenance that is the heaviest felted red wool you have ever seen. Um, so these come in lots of different styles, but if you see a red hat that has an ermine or a white booty de song brim, that may well be a cap of maintenance worn by a member of the Order of the Pelican. Um, someone had asked with regards to the sergeantry and the courtier scholars, etc who are sworn to a landed baron or baroness, would or could this be considered an award as it generally requires a set of trials be completed and therefore the individual would not be claiming a title due to a fealty relationship, but due to the receipt of an award. As a note, I'm totally with you on the fealty doesn't equal title thing, but thought I'd ask. Um, so this is from my understanding, and this may have changed. These are not generally things that are entered into the order of precedence, so much as it is a job that is taken on. You step into the office of sergeant, much like you step into an office of chatelaine or an office of signet for a reign. And it is also understood, and I believe this is still the case, and I their excellencies may correct me if I'm wrong, that if you are offered a peerage in the same area in which you are currently a sergeant or courtier or scholar, that it is expected that you will return your belt and no longer be in that office. There are no other awards in our society that require you to resign them if you get the next higher quote unquote award. So could it be argued that way? Probably, um, but it has, Sergeant has never been treated as a title in on tier. It has always been treated as a relationship with originally the baroness for the sergeants, and then with either the baron or baroness for the expanded sergeant corps. So that is the, that is the current uh, custom and the current understanding, at least the last time I made a great study of it. Um, one, of the, one of the current active protocol heralds in Ontier could no doubt give you further and much more detailed information, but that's what I have at the moment. 
Um, should you misgender someone, are you still being courteous? If you are making your best attempt, yes, I think you are. If someone corrects you, uh, as with any misgendering, you apologize, you correct yourself, you move on. Um, this is not the time to make it about you. This is not the time to, oh my God, you have to forgive me. I'm so sorry. No, just, I beg your pardon, milady. Um, you know, if you come up and say, excuse me, my lord, and then I'm a lady, I beg your pardon, my lady, and you move on. Um, much like if you had walked up to someone and said, excuse me, sir, and they said, I'm not a sir, I beg your pardon, ma'am, and you move on. That's, that's as much as it needs to be. So someone asked about the, um, the titles of master and mistress and the current uh, request from uh, black and indigenous persons of color to find alternates to them uh, because of uh, traumas in those community. Uh, I have heard from a number of peers who have personally chosen to use, to find and use other titles. Uh, I think that this is something that is just starting to come to the awareness of a lot of members of the peerage. Uh, and I think that that is best left as a conversation within those orders and not a general discussion in a courtesy and protocol class. But I think that in general, courtesy demands that if someone says, this makes me uncomfortable, I find this problematic, that courtesy demands that we try and find a way to not make them uncomfortable. Whether that's possible, I don't know but I think courtesy demands that we try. Um, I am not a member of a peerage order. I do not have a horse in that race. I am not a black indigenous or person of color. I am very much white Caucasian. Um, and so that is, that is on neither side a place where I am speaking from any position of authority. If you are not certain how someone should be addressed, and goodness knows this has happened to me at Penzik because regalia varies so greatly from kingdom to kingdom. It is always appropriate to ask politely. Now, politely means you do not interrupt someone if they are in the middle of something. Politely means that you do not intrude on a private conversation politely means that you find a time, if possible, when the wearer of the regalia you are curious about is not obviously otherwise occupied, and you approach them and say, I beg your pardon, but I do not recognize the coronet, medallion, whatever piece of regalia it is that you're curious about that you are wearing. Can you explain to me its significance? In most cases, much like asking a laurel about your art, this is a time where you brace yourself for an answer. Because in almost every time I have had this happen, not only do I find out what the rank is and where it's for, but who made the coronet and how long it's been in that rank, and I, I get the whole history of all the things which for me is fascinating and exactly what I wanted to know. But it is much like asking a laurel or an artisan about their art. Um, as someone just typed in the, in the chat, pull up a chair. Um, that isn't the kind of response you can demand, but it certainly is the sort of response you should be prepared for. I, I find it fascinating and lovely that people are so willing to share that information with others. And mostly the people who have on uh, the pointy hats, as I call them in general, are happy to tell you all about them, who made them, what the ranks are, how they developed over time. Um, James Starfall, the once and every other King of the West, um, when he was visiting on tier a number of years ago, I had the chance to 
uh, photograph his ducal coronet for my pointy hat spotter's guide. And he told me all about how it was originally this just plain four pointed when he was a Viscount and then he got his county and so they cut the embattlements in it. And then he got his duchy and so they put the, the leaves on it. And if you look at the coronet, you can see how it evolved over the course of his multitude of ranks. And, and I, I love that sort of personal history that is in these, these objects that we as a society have created. It is one of the things that makes that makes part of the magic for me in our society. And it is one of the reasons that I am a protocol herald. And it is one of the reasons that I love the work that I do at Penzik with all of the, the heralds and the crowns for opening ceremonies. And it is one of the reasons that I will still be doing this 20 more years from now. You know, sometimes you find out about this great grant award in the kingdom or a baronial award that was closed after so many members because a baron and baroness passed away or you get these little nuggets of of gold that are that are the history of our society and and panning for that sort of gold is is magic and the people in our society are wonderfully generous with their knowledge and their passion so there's, there's one more topic that I would like to touch on, and that is the sort of setting up of court and what might be asked of you if you are asked to be part of the onion, uh, to be part of retinue, to be a guard, to help set up court. Um, where do the chairs go? Where do you set up the audience? That sort of thing. But before I move on to sort of that final topic, I do want to check and see if anyone has any questions about titles, forms of address, relationships, regalia of rank, uh, any of those sorts of topics. Uh, unsure question, I have a red Norse skull cape. Can I wear that without being misinterpreted? Absolutely. Uh, the only time where, where caps of maintenance really become an issue is if there is very obviously a ermine or white with red goots de song brim on the on the the cap red hats are not prohibited by all means wear your red hat just don't line it in a fur that from a distance is going to look like ermine and turn it up so you see a brim of ermine that's a little sketchy line it in black or brown, or dark gray, or green. Green would be lovely. Uh, <laughs> sometimes see men with large chains. Is this just jewelry or does this mean something? Uh, within the kingdom of Antir, generally if you see someone who is wearing a, a, a heavy chain that has nothing hanging off of it, um, that heavy chain is unless it is made of black iron, it is almost certainly belonging to a member of the order of chivalry, that is to say a knight. Um, there is an award in on tier, um, and I believe it is the award of the iron chain. And you can look it up in kingdom law. It is for, I think, valor in the real world, like saving somebody's life sort of deal. There aren't very many of them around, but there may be a few old timer SCA humans who still have them. Um, but for the most part, if you see an unadorned heavy chain of silver, gold, brass, etc., that is almost certainly a member of the Order of the Chivalry. And if you take a look at their, um, at their belt, chances are good it's gonna be white. Um, but there, there are a handful of black chains around, which are for the member, the members of the iron chain. Uh, and so that does exist in Ontario, and those pieces of regalia do exist. So if you do see someone who has a, um, a black chain and not a white belt, they are not breaking Ontario's regalia laws. All right, is there any rule of etiquette with passing regalia along to newer members of an order, in particular peerage orders? Also, when it comes to coronets, is it standard to use the same coronet modified for each new rank 
or does somebody usually have a new one made each time? So let me answer those sort of in order. There are, with regards to the peerage regalia, there's two different answers to that question. Um, one of those is that in some cases there is specific, there are specific legacy medallions, which are explicitly to be handed down to the next member. Um, North Shield has a legacy medallion for um, its Order of the Laurel, for its Order of the Pelican, for its Order of Defense, um, and there is some sort of legacy something for the Order of Chivalry, but I can't tell you off the top of my head what it is. I think there's a horn. Um, and that is specifically designed to be given to each new member of the Order and to be worn by them until the next member is inducted and then passed along. And the um, lineage of that particular piece of regalia is read at each induction, at each investiture, so that all of the laurels created by the Kingdom of North Shield are in every ceremony that, in, that invests a new laurel. Um, the College of Heralds, has a legacy laurel medallion and a legacy pelican medallion, which are passed to active members of the College of, of Arms, uh, society-wide, who are given their laurels or their pelicans for their service to the Society College of Arms. Um, so those are specifically legacy regalia. They're specifically designed to be passed along. As for passing along personal regalia, that's up to each individual. Um, some people decide, hey, I really like this person and I would like to pass my medallion on to them. Um, sometimes this is from a peer to a now former student. Sometimes it is to someone whose work you've admired. Uh, there are any number of reasons you might choose to make a personal piece of regalia into a legacy piece that you are handing down. Um, so, but that is ultimately up to the individual who owns that piece of regalia. Um, when it comes to coronets, uh, it's ultimately up to each person. Uh, if you've got the money and you wanna design a new coronet, you can have a new coronet made every year as far as we're concerned. Um, there are some people who just sort of have the new deedly bobs stuck on the old coronet. There are some people who, who commission entirely new regalia. Sometimes it depends how old is your old regalia. If you were a countess for 20 years and your old coronet is getting kind of beat up and you were seen again, maybe you just commission a new ducal coronet. So I think there's a lot of things that go into those decisions, but they're very personal decisions. I've seen those sorts of things go either way and there's no wrong way to do it because you're, you still have entitlement from your previous ranks, right? Just because you become a duchess does not mean you are no longer also a countess. So you, it's not like you are no longer entitled to wear a county coronet. It's just that you are now also entitled to wear a ducal coronet. So if you are tapped for being their excellency's retinue or you are asked to assist with court for their majesties, what kinds of things you might be asked to do? So you might be asked to be a guard. You are asked to be a guard. You are there to provide window dressing. Um, you are there to stand there and look imposing with a weapon. Uh, you are there to uh, provide an escort should someone come unescorted into court and should they desire an escort or the nobility desire that they be escorted. Uh, you are there if you are instructed to do so and some nobles want this to happen and others do not, um, but you are there to challenge or block people who come forward armed who should not. Um, but that's a conversation you should have with your nobility and make sure that that is something they want you to be doing 
and if they want you to be doing it that you are very clear and they are very clear about whom should be stopped and whom should not. Um, so that's, that's the, the simplest of the positions, so to speak. Um, to be retinue behind the thrones, um, there are a number of things that happen behind the thrones. Um, one of those is to ensure that the nobility, anyone who is sitting on a seat and facing the audience, are taken care of, that their cups are filled with hydrating beverages or whatever their beverage of choice happens to be at the time, that if the court is a particularly long one that they have something to snack on, and that they have anything they need to do their business in that court, whether that's gifts for the other nobility, whether that's scrolls to be handed out, whether that's regalia to be handed out to new members of orders, um, all of the things that they shouldn't have in their hands, but they will need to hand out. Um, the retinue is responsible for organizing and making sure it is handed seamlessly and magically to the nobility as soon as it is needed, not before and not after. The retinue is there to help the theater of court move more smoothly to make the nobility look good, um, to keep things running in a timely manner, and to keep up the, the belief that these are powerful nobles who have people at their beck and call. Uh, Again, this goes back to that phrase on the inside of the crowns of Kaid, you rule because they believe. A good retinue helps shore up that belief of everyone watching court. Um, retinue may also be um, taking notes for things like court reports. Um, the herald for court and any of the herald's assistants are also to some extent considered the retinue behind the thrones. Um, they are announcing any orders of business. They are being the voice of the crown. Um, they are calling for cheers. Uh, they are letting uh, the nobles know what business is coming next and generally ensuring that the flow of business is uninterrupted and very smooth. Um, the job of a court herald is outside the scope of this class. Um, it is possible to volunteer. If you would like to see how the sausage is made, you may go to their excellencies. You can go to the chamberlain or head lady in waiting or whomever is in charge of making sure the nobles are being taken care of. And you can say, I would like to help. Um, and I would say start locally, start with people that you know. Um, being retinue can also be attending a noble throughout the day outside of court, uh, carrying a bag or basket with their, uh, their necessities, holding on to their drink for them. Um, taking care of the coronet and holding it respectfully and level in both hands should they need to use the privy um, because coronets should not go into Porta Johns ever. Um, this, is, this is a recipe for disaster, just don't do it. Hand it to a member of your retinue, have the retinue hold it respectfully and give it back to you when you are done. <coughs> um, Retinue can also be a filter. Nobles are very visible and they are also very busy. And the higher up the nobility chain you go, the more visible and the more busy. That means that sometimes someone else has to step in and say, I'm sorry, your majesty, but you have a meeting we need to get to 
to interrupt a conversation and to make sure that the crown stays on schedule. Um, so those can be duties of retinue as well. Um, there is also the setup of court. So how do we set up the thrones for court? The first thing we find out is we find out whose court is it? Is it considered to be a baronial court in which their majesties are visiting? Is it considered to be a principality court? Is it considered to be a royal court? Whosever court it is, as in the overarching court, whosever court it is sits front and center. Tradition in Antir is, or at least was when I was there, that if their majesties are present, it is their court, regardless of whose lands you are in. There are some places where that is not the case, where their majesties will sit in on a baronial or a principality court, and the baronial seats or the principality seats will be centered. However, it is generally considered in on tier that it is the ranking nobles whose home ground it is. So if you are in the barony of Adiantum and their highnesses summits are present, it is considered to be their highnesses court. If you are in the barony of Adiantum and their highnesses summits and their majesties on tier are present, it is considered to be their majesties on tiers court. So, Whosever court it is, is front and center. From that point, you move outward, alternating sides, descending in rank. Um, at wars, when there are multiple crowns, it depends. Um, for Penzik, it is rare to have a court where there is more than one set of royals. For opening ceremonies, uh, it alternates by treaty, whether it is considered Mid-Realms War or East Kingdom's War. However, because it is being held in Ethelmark's lands, they are generally allowed to stand center stage for opening ceremonies. Um, in general, whosoever lands you are in has precedence, and then it is oldest kingdom first. So if we are in on tier, on tier's crown has precedence, and then we go west, east, middle, Kaid, and I forget the rest of them from there. No, sorry, west, east, middle, Aitenvelt, and I forget the rest from there. Um, if we are in the middle, the Mid-Realm's crown takes precedence, and then it is West, East, Aitenvelt, and the rest from there. There is a list of kingdoms by precedence on the sca.org website, which will give you the date of their first coronation, which is the date from which their precedence descends. Um, if you are within a kingdom that has principalities, the principalities have precedence within that kingdom, based on the date of their first court, their, the first investiture of their first prince and princess. Um, the baronies have precedence based on the investiture of their first baron and baroness. Um, Cormac Moore, who just stepped down as Wreath King of Arms, did a whole project where he determined the precedence of every kingdom, every principality, and every barony in the known world. And then he printed them all on a blanket because he could. Um, so the information is out there if you have to determine. Generally, home kingdom has advantage. So the home crown, every other king, king and queen. The home prince and princess, other princes and princesses from that kingdom, visiting princes and princesses in order. Whether you put the princes and princesses in order by their kingdom or by their strict principality date is an interesting question and ultimately one you kind of 
pick an answer, you go to your crown and you ask, your majesty, which would you prefer? And if they say, I don't know, you say, here's what I would suggest your majesty, and then they let you do it. Um, and that is generally what I would say for any sort of sticky protocol situation. You go to their, to the nobility who is in charge. You say, here are the options, which would you prefer? If they don't have an answer, you give them whatever you think the best option is and say, would that be acceptable? And then you go forth and make whatever they say happen. Because ultimately, on the game side of things, the crown's word is law. And if the crown decides that for today, the baron and baroness outrank everybody in the kingdom, including them, then that's the way it is for today because that's what's written into kingdom law is that the crown's word is law. But there are a lot of crowns out there who don't know, who don't care or both. And so having a solution ready, even if it's not the best ultimate whatever solution, having a solution ready so you can say, how about this, your nobleness? And they will say, yes, make that so. And you can go forth and make that so with the blessing of the noble in charge. There is a slight difference if you are setting up an even number of sets of chairs versus an odd number of sets of chairs that has to do with the very center of the dais. Um, so you either have two in the middle or you have three in the middle. If you have two in the middle, it is generally that the right stage right is higher precedence sorry stage left so the right hand side as you look at it higher precedence drives the bus if there are three in the middle the highest precedence goes in the middle and the next highest precedence is to their right and the way you remember that is that the Christ is on the right-hand side of the Father. That's the only way I remember it. I don't have a non-religious reference for you, I'm afraid. Is, are the right-hand man, there we go. Is the monarch or the consort higher precedence? Neither. Most kingdom law has them equal in precedence. North Shield policy, uh, custom, is that the king drives the bus. That is to say the monarch drives the bus. They sit to the left as the two of them are sitting next to each other. And if I recall correctly from a number of Ontarian crowns, that is backwards. So Ontir often has the king sitting to the right. So whichever way their majesties prefer because it doesn't matter. Take a look at the next couple of crowns or take a look at some old photographs and see which one you see more often. It really, they are the same precedence, which is one of the reasons why the newer kingdoms do not have separate um, heraldic arms for the consort. There is just the arms of the crown and kingdom. Someone suggests a single extra sturdy throne and one can sit on the other's lap. Well, that would make a lovely visual joke for about 30 seconds. Having had someone of similar weight to me sitting on my lap, I would be in pain in almost no time at all. And most people's laps are not comfy places to sit. So I wouldn't wanna be either person in that particular situation. Um, but, you know, if their majesties decide it to be so, sure, I'm sure we can find a piece of furniture large and sturdy enough somewhere here on site, your majesties, and we can make that happen. Um, one of the past protocol heralds here in North Shield wrote almost flippantly and amusingly into our book of ceremony that if their majesties wanted to hold court on their heads, they could. And one of our 
pairs of royals decided that that sounded like a fine plan. And they did, in fact, hold a royal court while standing on their heads. There's video, if anyone would care to look it up. Um, I will post it to the Facebook for this event because it is it is one of the great royal whim sorts of things. It was also a fundraiser for our kingdom. And it was, if, if everyone collectively will pledge this much to the royal travel fund, we will hold a court on our heads. And people said, yes, we want to see that. And they made it happen. And the retinue and the two guards and the herald also stood on their heads. I think it was the herald. Maybe not the Herald, but at least the two guards also stood on their heads because it was their majesty's decree. It was not a particularly long court, but there was a court that was upside down in North Shield. They had cushions and they practiced. North Shield was highly amused for months. <laughs> So that's, that's the setting up chairs in order. You, you, put the, you put the middle in place and then you alternate off to the sides until you either run out of space or you run out of chairs. Being behind the thrones, your excellencies, I highly recommend if you have not already, invest in padding for your retinue behind the thrones if you hold in, indoor events. Many of our events are held at indoor venues with concrete floors and standing for court, even North Shield courts, which are nowhere near as long as Ontarian courts, on concrete hurts. And so we have bought anti-fatigue mats and those sort of two-foot puzzle square foam squares that you buy for kids' play pens, and they get tucked in with the, the foldable thrones and they are behind the thrones for court. Um, and they are a godsend for indoor courts. So for any nobility who is watching this, if you do not have such a thing, I highly recommend investing in it. Many on tier courts are outdoors and in grass, and so it is less of a concern, uh, but fatigue really is a thing. Don't lock your knees if you are standing guard or standing retinue. If you are not feeling well, please do not faint. Please do not fall down. Please make sure that you are hydrating. Please make sure that you have eaten. Please make sure that you are taking as good care of yourself as you are taking care of your nobility, um, or else you will not be able to take care of them any longer. It does not serve them to overwork yourself into a puddle of goo. Um, so that's everything that I had on my list of things to cover. Uh, I would be happy to take questions to uh, clarify uh, on these particular topics. Uh, if there are any questions further from here, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you to their excellencies for inviting me to teach.